Have you ever played a game with no rules? Have you ever played a game with no rules? Or maybe. Or maybe played a game where not everybody agrees on the rules. Yep. Thanks, Eric. Um, no, seriously. Have you sat down and, and played a game with somebody? In particular, we're in the Midwest, right? We play euchre. We play cards. Have you ever had to sit down and, and play the game and then suddenly in the middle of it realize that they're playing by different rules than you? That suddenly you realize they're going, oh, I have... It's, it's no face, no ace. If you've ever played Euchre and somebody does this and you are not a fan of this, you're like, no, 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 no. Because no face, no, no ace means that you have a bunch of nines and tens in your hand, right? And that you're asking, I want a redeal. <laughs> I want another chance at this hand. Now, some people do not agree with this as a rule in Euchre and you are just not right when you ask for this. So sometimes when we sit down to even just play a game with each other, we need to like verify what the rules are. Now, I have some advice for you all um, regarding some games, particularly board games. Never play apples to apples with Kevin Kosky. <laughs> Never. One, he hates it. He hates it because he says there are new rules and it makes no sense. Now, it does have rules but the rules change, and that just irks him. Now, I get it, but the rules change based on the player. You don't play the game, you play the player. And that sometimes isn't always the game you want to play. It's not like Monopoly or, you know, Candyland. So you kind of have to know what are the rules of the game. And we do this in life, not just board games and card games. I mean, we have laws that govern how we got here today in our cars. We have laws that govern how our day-to-day our -day works. We're even abiding under a law that says we change the time based on what day it is in the season. So, you know, we usually like rules and laws that benefit us. We like when they work in our favor. We're not that big a fan of rules and laws that inconvenience us or that we feel don't benefit us to the way that we want to be benefited. Now, sometimes we want to disregard laws that seem inconvenient. You know, maybe the speed limit um, at times. Or do I really have to fully stop at this stop sign or I'm just going to roll right through it? You know, there's all sorts of laws that we kind of ignore at times because they seem inconvenient to us. But do we often consider what those rules are grounded in? What is the basis for them? What is the philosophy, the guiding principle behind it? Is it to ensure people's safety? Is it to ensure that people's rights are protected? Is it to ensure that a game is played fairly? What laws are grounded in matters. And sometimes it matters even more than the law itself because it's that principle that should guide the enactment of that law. And interestingly enough, today in our passage, John, the writer of this gospel, gives us a conversation between Jesus and a man named Nicodemus that is actually concerned with what matters in the law. Now, at first read, we kind of listen in on this conversation that Jesus has about what it is to be born anew or to be born again. But as we kind of dig into what Nicodemus and Jesus are talking about and we consider what maybe is going on behind. What are they really bringing to the table? Who and what do they represent? We start to realize that we're talking what matters. What are the guiding principles? What is the guiding understanding of how we live our lives and our faith? And this is revealed throughout this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus. And it's kind of an interesting way to look at this. And so we have to understand who Nicodemus is. He's a Pharisee. 
So he is a man in the Jewish culture. He's part of this group of people who are very traditional. He's devoted to the law, primarily the Mosaic law, the law that comes to us from the Old Testament. He's been devoted in his life to keeping the traditions alive. And he's been doing this in the face of Roman opposition and cultural assimilation. So he has always felt kind of this push against what comes at him in his faith and what is important to him in his faith. And, and oftentimes as Christians, we want to just completely either disregard the law. You know, it's like it doesn't matter in the face of grace now. We don't have to really even understand this. And we have whole groups of people who just want to even disregard the entire Old Testament. Like it's too hard to read. It's too violent. You know what? Just give me Jesus. But we forget Jesus was Jewish. Jesus came out of this culture, out of this history, and it is critical to understand it. So we can't just discard it. And we hear this in kind of understanding that God's law was given to the people of Israel to reveal the holiness of God, the character of God, and our frailty as humanity. The law became a standard for which I, we could understand who God is and who we are not. And in the law, we see how much we need God. There are actually 613 laws in the Old Testament. 613. I don't even want to count that high. And they cover everything from our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, as well as sometimes how to dress or what fabrics to wear, what to eat, how to worship, how to build the temple. Now, most of us are familiar with the central commandments that are given to us. We refer to them as the Ten Commandments, the thou shalt nots or the thou shalts. And I think we understand how those are somewhat universal. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery. These are all things I think we go, yeah, those are pretty good things. I, I can live by those. It has benefits for us and our relationships. But it matters. It matters in particular why we do them. Do we choose to not lie because we are told that we need to be truthful? Or do we not lie because we value honesty, and we value being known in this world by who we are, really, not by lies that we construct. Do we not commit murder because, man, it's too much trouble to bury a body? Have you ever really tried to dig a hole? I mean, seriously, have you ever tried to dig a hole? I mean, they make it look so easy on TV. But if you've ever really tried to dig a hole, that's a whole lot of work. You may go... Yeah, murder's just not worth it. No. And you know, I'm really not cut out for prison, so I'm just not going to do that. Or do you not commit murder because you honor life and you see it as a gift given by God and that it is precious? Why you choose to kind of follow a law matters. What is the law grounded in for you? So when Jesus and Nicodemus are, are facing off in this conversation, there is this undercurrent in their conversation. Why? What matters to you in this? And the interesting thing is that Nicodemus comes to Jesus to have this conversation after dark. He comes to him at night. Now, no doubt Nicodemus has recognized something in Jesus. There's something about him, something that he says must come from God because of the miracles he sees him performing. He may have even witnessed Jesus' actions that happened in the temple right before this conversation that Nicodemus has with him, where Jesus is in the temple and he is angry and he overturns tables. He is upset because there are people in the temple profiting off the pilgrims who have come to worship. So basically people are abusing folks who have come from far away to worship. And Jesus is upset by this abuse. So no doubt Nicodemus has seen and heard a lot about Jesus. But he is cautious. He is cautious because he's not sure about Jesus. 
and he wants to protect himself, he wants to protect his reputation, his standing. So he comes to Jesus at night, not wanting to be seen talking to this teacher, this rabbi, Jesus. And this conversation they have as it revolves around this idea of being born anew or born again. And at first when we read this, we kind of think, Nicodemus seems really confused by this. You know, is he taking it literally or not? But it also could be a debate tactic, a means in the conversation to really get Jesus to define what he means by born again or born anew. See, Nicodemus is a man of the law. He knows it. Those 613 laws that I can't count, he knows them. He breathes them. He protects them. He has devoted his life to them. And this Jesus, this man, comes along, and he ends this, much like he upturned those tables in the temple. Now, for Nicodemus, his life has been constructed all along around very rigid guidelines, around what family you're born into, meaning he's Jewish, that he has adhered himself to the Pharisee sect within the Jewish faith. He's followed the rules and then some. He's not only followed them, he's probably helped enforce them. And then when Jesus says, we need to be born from above, what does that even mean? What does that even mean? Born from above, born again, born anew. If it's not literally, you know, which we kind of figure it's logistically probably not possible, but what is new birth? What does that really mean? I think that's a question for us to understand as well. Now, some of us will even name a date in our lives where we say, I was born again this date, or I am born again. But what does that mean? And I think we can boil it down in essence to a very simple concept of it means that we trust God, that we have belief, that we trust in God and not our own power. See, a baby doesn't birth themselves. Birth happens to them. New life comes to them. So the question is, do you trust in the law or do you trust in the law giver? Do you trust in your ability, your control, your power, your ability to obey the law, or do you trust the one who gave the law to you? Do you trust God who gave the law really to point to him, to let us know who he was, what his character was like, what he expects out of life with us? See, obeying the law was meant to show that we trusted God, not to earn the means to God. But people have always gotten caught up into our own abilities, our own power, our own desire to be our own God. Our ability that we say, oh, I'm good enough. I can earn my way there. I can do it. Our self-sufficiency robs us of abundance in Christ. See, when we try to earn our way to God, whether it's following rules or just trying to live the best life we possibly can without fully trusting God, we miss out. See, our rescue from our failings, our sins, our selfishness doesn't come from our ability to follow rules. It comes from God. Our rescue comes from above. See, true religion, true religion is vertical. It has to do with God's spirit. God doesn't demand any preparation for us to come to him. We don't have to get ourselves cleaned up. We don't have to make ourselves well. We come to the healer to make us well. Nothing that we do makes us acceptable to him because he already loves us. We don't do the work. He does. Again, a baby doesn't birth themselves. 
See, our role in salvation is belief, not rule following. And this belief, yes, is aided by God's spirit in us. So even in that, God helps us. Finding ourselves born anew, as Jesus said, in water and spirit. In the water, I'm talking about the repentance that John the Baptist preached about. Repentance really being just turning towards God. Recognizing we can't do it on our own and that we need him. A turn towards God. And trusting in his spirit to be our rescue. Now I get Nicodemus. Because I think for us at times it is so hard to see beyond what we know. And the thing is, Nicodemus knew a lot. He was a smart guy. He was educated. He was so invested in his world that he had to come to Jesus at night. He couldn't even be risked seeing, talking to this man. He was unwilling to risk his reputation, unwilling to risk his comfort. And sometimes the greater our comfort, the harder it is to see the need for God. Sometimes the greater our comfort, the harder it is to see our need for God. To sometimes even hear and receive him. And sometimes, this is where it gets dangerous, sometimes even religious knowledge can be a barrier. See, we feel like we have all the answers, and we become even a little bit jaded and cynical in them. And we stop being curious. I think that is sometimes the greatest threat to our faith in the long run, is we stop being curious. We stop seeing God in unexpected places because we think we have it all figured out. Because looking for more would disrupt our comfort. The reality is we can know all about God. We can know all about God and never experience his love. It's like knowing all about wine and never tasting it. It's like knowing all about the Grand Canyon, how it was formed, how all the layers work together, the history of it as well as the prehistory of it. Knowing all of that and never seeing it in real life. If you've ever stood in front of the Grand Canyon, it is an experience you do not forget. We can read and know all about it. Even the pictures sometimes you're like, that's beautiful. But when you stand in it, in front of it, over it, It's mind-boggling. It's the same with God. We can know all about God and never experience him because we lack trust in him. And this is what Nicodemus wrestles with. He trusts more in what he knows and the law than he does in God. He trusts in what he knows best. And so that's a question for us. Do we trust in what we know, or do we trust in God? Do we trust in God's love for us? Trust fully that God loves us, regardless of if we get it right. Regardless of what we have done in our past. Regardless of if we fail again, if we don't get it all right. If we make a mistake, do we trust that God will still love us and does love us? Because he does. This is the law of love. And this has the potential to rewrite our stories. And Jesus, if we allow him, will rewrite our stories in love. Not change the facts, but how we understand them. See, is the law a means to control us? Or is it to show us the holiness of God and our need for God? 
or to illustrate this another way, I had a conversation with a colleague who is adopted. And because of my children, I was paying close attention to what he was sharing. He and his sister were both adopted. And he was telling us that each of them had a very different view of their adoption. Raised in the same household, having the same experience of adoption. But she saw her life as one of rejection and being unwanted. While he saw himself as chosen, loved, and wanted. Same home, same family. Two different stories written because of perspective. Different perspectives based on love and how they viewed love. And I think Nicodemus is faced with the same thing. Is the law or how we follow the law or our actions or what we do, is that what saves us? Or is it God's redeeming love? The work of Christ is God's love at work. Now, Nicodemus is pretty infatuated with his love of the law. He's held by it. He's held by it the same way that many of us are held in our own desire for control and power where we are more wrapped up in our abilities, our wealth, our maybe our ability to take care of everyone and everything, to keep everything together under our own power as we try to just keep it all together. We are more focused on that than we are in trusting God. See, sometimes we don't always get wrapped up in maybe the biblical rules and laws like Nicodemus, but we do get wrapped up in other things where we place our trust. We trust our own abilities to save ourselves rather than God, and we miss out. We figure, I'm good enough to get by. I'm not as bad as that person. I got it pretty good. And we trust in our own power rather than his. So where do we place our trust? Do we place it in the cross, the expression of God's great love for us? Do we trust fully in him, or is God really just a backup plan or a nice idea, a plan B for when we fall short? See, the problem with that is, is we're going to fall short, so we might as well make God plan A from the beginning. So my friends, do we trust that God is enough? Because when we do, following the law becomes a response to that love, not a means to earn it. Because Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. Now, if you heard me today and you think, oh, I don't have to follow any rules or any laws. No, no we're, we're to follow the law of love. God even gives us this command to love God and love others, and everything else falls under that. That's pretty serious stuff. So Jesus didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Because when we trust God is enough, we know that we can follow his law as a response to his goodness. Because we can take that risk knowing if we fail, he's got it. This isn't a means then to earn his approval, but simply to respond to the great love that we have received and trust in daily. We lean into God's spirit knowing that he is enough even when we are not, and so often we are not. So I have a question for us this week. Do we trust that God is enough? I want you to seriously think about this question for yourself. Do you trust that God is enough? Does Mariah trust that God is enough? And if not, ask God for the grace 
to do so. That's the beautiful thing. We don't have to get there on our own. He makes a way. Trust him to do so. This is his to lose and ours to gain. Now, an interesting tidbit about Nicodemus is that he walks away from his conversation with Jesus, but he is not unchanged. We will see him again in John's gospel. Interestingly enough, we will see him at Jesus' death, offering spices to help prepare Jesus' body at burial, helping John or Joseph at Arimathea to bury Jesus' body. This man who hid his conversation with Jesus is now helping to bury this man. I think something stuck with him as he openly cared for Jesus after his death and before his resurrection. Interesting. So my friends, as we prepare to head for communion together as we prepare to head into our weeks I want us to sit with this question do we trust that God is enough and if not to ask God to give us that grace let us pray gracious holy God loving creator Lord, help us overcome our unbelief. Strengthen us to trust fully in you. Lord, give us the courage to step out of our comfort and to lean into you. Lord, give us strength to disrupt those things in our lives that we have placed more trust in than you. Lord, let us lean fully into your love, knowing that it is enough and that when we draw strength from it, we can take so many amazing risks for you. We can love boldly, courageously, because you are enough. God, give us faith to move mountains gives us love and compassion and kindness that changes this world every day. We ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.